Asylum, Tropical Island Survival, Week 3, Day 1. It's been two weeks at this point, and no one has come to rescue me, despite my best efforts of laying out bright patterns on the beach and trying to maintain a large fire at all times. It's long past time someone should have come looking for me, and in fact, long past the period when a rescue party would have given up, which means I need to start settling in for the long haul, as I don't think I'm properly equipped to try and leave the island, at least not yet. I should begin by securing more renewable sources of food. I'd like to be able to take advantage of the chickens running wild on the island, as they are an immediately available but untapped resource. However, I'm not really sure about how to go about catching them, or if I'd even want to. I'd have to make a paddock for them and find food to feed them, and that'd be more work for me. Instead, I have a mind to build a collection of roosts around the forest, and the chickens can free-range feed themselves, but have a place to sleep and lay their eggs that's safe from predators. Because these are wild chickens, they'll be able to fly a short distance in height, another thing I learned from Dirty Jobs, so I can build the roosts on tall posts, as their only enemy will probably be the sea snakes. I'll put little roofs on them, almost like a birdhouse, and weave the platforms like wicker in a hexagonal formation, so there are six roosts arranged around a central pole, I'll carefully weave in a few thorny branches to keep animals from climbing up from underneath, and set the platform up about as high as I can reach, but still short enough that I can reach the eggs. After doing my survival chores, I spent the first couple of hours in the morning looking for chickens, and finding out where they already like to hang out and forage, which was unsurprisingly near clusters of fruit trees. I found a good spot roughly in the middle of their favorite area, grabbed a stick, stuck it in the ground, and tied a flower to the top of it to make it easier for me to find later. Then I dug a hole where I planned to erect my big birdhouses a short distance away, and a little closer to my hut. I did this several times, and once I bagged about half a dozen good sites, I headed back to base and gathered bamboo, harakeke, and firewood on my way back. I also kept my eyes open for any plants that had thorny branches and discovered a tree with some kind of large citrus fruit on it. I took a specimen back with me to describe in my plants notebook later. Back at base, I took the larger sticks and carved them to a point on one end. The bamboo wouldn't take a point because it was hollow, but I did carve some of it into three angular supports for the base of the poles. I know that chickens will be landing on and jumping off this structure regularly, so it'll need to be stabilized. I put notches in the posts for supports to catch on, in addition to affixing them with cord. I thought about using cords as guide wires, but thought that chickens might get tangled in them if something went wrong. Next, I put some notches near the top of the posts and tied three smaller pieces of bamboo to them in sort of an equilateral triangle arrangement, and used more bamboo to make triangular trusses so they can bear more weight. Finally, I used some of the thinner bamboo to weave a wicker platform about two feet wide onto the horizontal trusses, while carefully weaving an open lattice of thorny branches around the angled trusses to keep snakes from climbing up. I also took the time to weave a flat, conical basket out of bamboo and harakeke, and tied it to the very top of the post to create a roof for the birdhouse. I took a lunch break after building one birdhouse, and wrote down my description of the citrus tree I discovered while I was eating. Then I went out to install the birdhouse at the nearest site to my base. I brought some breadfruit, spoiled fish, and any waste plant material I've been collecting like bamboo leaves, and scattered it around the birdhouse. I know that chickens are omnivores, so even if they don't eat this food themselves, it'll attract bugs that they would probably like to eat. I also filled the platform with the plant materials I've observed that they like to nest and lay their eggs in, usually scattered about on the ground. Once the birdhouse was up, I threw a coconut at it to make sure it could handle something the approximate size and weight of a chicken flying into it at full speed. When I was content with its apparent strength, I returned to base. Now I'm going to spend the remainder of the day building three more of these birdhouses. Green Grapefruit Branching tree with glossy oval leaves and large oblong citrus fruit with green or yellow skin and pink flesh. Tastes like grapefruit. Spreads by seeds and runners. Edible. Week 3, 
day two. After doing my morning chores, I went to the woods and checked on the birdhouse I've already built to see if the chickens were actually nesting in it and whether I needed to make any adjustments to the design. Since they appear to have no natural fear of me, and because the birdhouses pretty much looked like a tree to them, and there was food around and in it, it looks like a few of them had no problem hopping up and settling in for the night. I even found an egg in one of the roosts. It still gives me a few ideas for adjustments to make the birdhouses more attractive or comfortable to them, so I'll make those adjustments before finishing the remaining birdhouses. I gathered some more breadfruit on my way back and checked on the tap I installed in the tree the other day. I found that the coconut shell did collect some latex, but over the course of several days it solidified into a hard, smelly lump that I can't really use for anything. I removed the lump and, without any better ideas, I partially filled the coconut with water. Hopefully this will dilute the latex enough to keep it from coagulating, and scrape the wound in the tree back open to get the sap flowing again. I finished the remaining birdhouses and headed into the woods to install them before lunch again spreading food around and in them to attract the chickens to them. From now on, I can check in every so often and see if there are any eggs in them, though I'll obviously put back any I can see have chicks in them. It occurred to me, though, that any chicks that hatch are going to have to jump down to the ground to get out of the nest, and they won't be able to get back up. That's actually fine in some ways, because the chicks are so small and light that they can survive a jump from that height without injury and they would be wandering around outside the nest anyway after hatching, following their mothers around. Still, to give them some protection and to incentivize them to stay near the birdhouses, I'll weave a protective covering around the base of the houses, across the lateral supports, and spread bamboo leaves for them to sleep on there, basically creating a second level for the birdhouse where the chicks can hide and the mothers can roost if they need to. I'm done now, and I think building these birdhouses has probably been doing something good for my psychological health, as well as my long-term physical health. Being forced to acknowledge the possibility that no one is coming for me and I'll never see my home again has made the lonelies kick in pretty badly. And I've been trying to keep myself distracted from it because there's nothing else I can do about it right now. But by helping these birds, learning their individual behaviors as I've watched them over the past few days, and even starting to name a few of them. It's helping me feel a little less alone. On that note, when I came back to the hut this afternoon, I found the bat was back, and this time it tentatively let me feed it some bananas. With the remainder of my afternoon free, I want to solidify some of my long-term plans, and there's some pretty big ones. I need to start producing my own food, and that means farming. So I want to expand my base into the clearing I found just up the hill from the beach hut, and build a garden there. It's going to have to be a big one in order to keep me loaded with calories, especially when the breadfruit are out of season. At least as big, if not bigger, than the homesteading garden Dad wanted to make back home, which I told him would never be big enough to sustain a family of four. Fortunately, I've already discovered several species of edible plants that I can begin cultivating, namely the taro, the purple yams, and the bottle gourds. The fruit trees will take too long to grow, so I can worry about planting an orchard later. I should start cultivating bamboo and sugarcane too. The trouble with taros, though, is that they require marshy conditions, and the yams are labor-intensive to harvest. I have a couple of schemes in mind for them, though. The first is to create a uniquely shaped pot or planter for the yams, which will be open at the bottom and have a partition with a hole in the middle. The idea is that, as the yam grows, some of its tubers will start growing out of the hole in the bottom of the partition. When I want a yam, I can just turn the pot over and pick them, without having to uproot the entire plant. Furthermore, the yams spread by creeping vines, so I can let them spread from pot to pot without my needing to be involved. For the taros, however, I was thinking of diverting part of the rivulet and making a small dam to create an artificial marsh with other potential applications later. For now, though, I'll just make a small marsh near the rivulet and see what kind of growing mediums the taro likes, ranging from clay to loose rocks to sand, looking for whichever one they grow best in but is also the easiest to harvest them from. I dug holes in the ground near the rivulet for it to flood into, and filled them with different growing mediums before going to the marsh to dig up some taros to transplant for the experiment. 
I sacrificed a few of my pots for the experiment, filling them with growing medium for periodic watering. Between these and the river taros, they should tell me whether or not taros prefer running or stagnant water. While I was digging for taros, I accidentally dug up another plant with similar leaves but no corms, so I held on to it for later description. For the yam growing experiments, I split a piece of bamboo down the middle and drilled holes in each chamber to make a perforated trough. I also carefully cut some slots in it to make it easier to thread established yam roots into them. I then filled the chambers with dirt. Each day, I'll trickle some water over them, using another trough of bamboo or coconut shells underneath to catch the water as it drips out. Nutrients should leach out of the dirt and onto the tubers for absorption. The question here is whether or not the roots can handle being exposed to the air and periodic moistening, effectively aeroponic gardening. I'm also going to have to keep the roots dark, otherwise they'll grow vines. So after standing the test trough on a couple of legs, I draped some banana and bamboo leaves over each side like a curtain to keep the roots dark. This only took a few minutes to set up. I then spent about an hour of digging up more yams now that I know what they look like. I noticed that there seemed to be a lot of them on the east side of the island, and while I was there, I dug up another similar looking tuber, but with white flesh, and took a few specimens back for description and cultivation. These experiments are probably going to take weeks to give me any results, so I'll spend my evening describing the two new plants I discovered in my notebook. Sweet Potato A crawling vine with delicate, heart-shaped leaves, with small purple flowers that resemble petunias. Large, underground tubers, spread by overground runners, useful for food. Intoxicating Heart Leaf Bush with thin, clustered branches growing from tangled roots, terminating in broad, heart-shaped leaves, with a white, fuzzy flower. Seeds resemble peppercorns and have spicy flavor. Leaves and roots have bitter flavor, causing numbness on the tongue and mild sensations of sleepiness and euphoria. Do not ingest again. Week 3, Day 3 after my morning chores, I checked on the plants, and most of them haven't enjoyed being transplanted, so I can't tell what works and what doesn't yet. Kind of reminds me of all the times Mom asked me and Nat to move the plants around the garden like decorative furniture. They didn't like it either. Regardless of the results of my test, I know I'm going to need a pond or terrace for the taro sooner or later, so I'll get started on that today. First. I need to decide where I'm going to put my terrace. Higher up on the hill, where I might get more pressure for a later project, or down low where they won't risk flooding the rest of my garden slash base. If any flooding occurs, it's probably going to be a small leak, not a catastrophic failure, so I can probably stop and fix it. Still, just in case, I should put some kind of emergency drain somewhere on the dike that diverts back into the rivulet Alternatively, I could let the drain trickle into my other crops, so the dike functions as a reservoir in the dry season. So, uphill it is, which will certainly be more work in the short term. Now we need to know how big to make my terrace. I figure each taro can't be more than 100 or 200 kilocalories each. So if I need 10 or 20 of them to keep me running for a day, and each plant takes up a square foot, then my garden needs to be about 7,500 square feet. That's a big area, and frankly too big for me to realistically cultivate, nor do I really need to. This is the tropics, so there aren't really traditional seasons. Plants grow all year round. If I can get about two crops in a year, I'll only need half that area, about 3,750 square feet. That's still a huge garden, but again, I don't need all of it. Breadfruit trees produce a lot more calories and a lot more fruit than taros or yams, at about 1,500 kilocalories per fruit, and maybe an average of 100 fruit per year. So I'd only need about five trees to keep me alive, and I've seen more than that on my foraging box. I can't just assume they'll always be in season, though, nor will I ever be able to collect and preserve all the fruit, nor do I want to hoard them from the native wildlife. These gardens will just be to supplement me during the off-season, so we can maybe divide the required area again to about 
1,250 square feet, or about a 35 by 35 foot area, which is much more manageable. I went to the clearing and outlined a good spot with my digging stick, adjacent to the rivulet and where the hillside gets too steep to easily build much else. I marked out a rectangular plot approximately 15 by 15 feet, because it looks like a good manageable size to start with. There will be room and time to expand it later if I need to. Then I made a line about halfway through it, marking the area I'll dig out to level the terrace, specifically on the mountain side of the line, as I'll be filling in the ocean side of the line to make the slope flat. I figure that volume of dirt is going to be a wedge, and because the slope is still relatively shallow, no more than 20 degrees, the wedge should be no more than 3 feet at its deepest, making the total volume I need to unearth about 300 cubic feet. If I can dig out about 1 cubic foot per minute with my sharpened stick, that'll only take me about 5 hours. Before I started digging though, I realized I was going to need a retaining wall for the dirt first, so the first thing I did was modify the dolly into a sort of wheelbarrow, using bamboo to create a flat platform on the end, so it can still be used as a dolly, and triangular cross braces on the sides to give it strength, which I filled in with wicker weaving to act as side walls. I also extended the bottom bar and secured some larger rings of bamboo to it, to function as rollers so I can drag it around a little more easily. With the wheelbarrow ready, I started collecting rocks, and there were plenty of nice basalt boulders piled up around the beach, sticking out of the sand. I figured that if the retaining wall was going to be at least one foot thick, and three feet tall at the highest, that meant I would need about 70 cubic feet of rock. The wheelbarrow is about two foot by three foot by one foot, so that meant I needed to make about 11 trips to the beach and back, up and downhill. I estimated each trip would take me about 10 minutes, so collecting all the rocks probably took me about 2 hours, though probably more because I quickly tired out from running up and down the hill so much. Reminds me of some of the summer jobs I had to do back home. When I needed a break, I sat down and started stacking rocks, but I quickly realized that, by themselves, they couldn't stack up very high, as they were only loosely held together. However, by digging into the hillside as I went, and using some water from the rivulet to turn that soil into clay, I was able to use it like mortar to build the retaining wall in layers like brick. This should make it nice and strong. I let the rocks decide how much they wanted to spread out at their base for support, before filling them in with clay. Because of all the dirt I had to set aside, the final terrace had a bit of a lip around it, which will be good for holding in topsoil and water for the taros. I only took a short break for lunch today, and while I tried to manage the wear on my muscles by alternating between tasks, I'm exhausted now, so I'm going to have dinner, get the water distilling for tomorrow, and go to bed early. Week 3, Day 4 I was out of firewood again this morning, so I spent an extra hour or so collecting more after my morning chores, so I don't have to worry about this tomorrow. It's really becoming a burden, though. I checked on my latex bowl again while I was out and about, and while adding water did seem to help, I can see the rubber has not precipitated out of the solution like I hoped it would, but floated to the top instead of sinking to the bottom, forming a thin, stretchy membrane at the surface of the water which could be potentially useful if it were thicker. I took everything back to base, and carefully decanted the water before spreading the partially coagulated latex out on the flat, smooth surface of my skillet to dry. I don't really have any ideas for how to use it right now. It's a step in the right direction, but still not quite useful yet. Just curdled clumps that look like so much cottage cheese. Uh, I reminded myself of how much I miss cheese. I racked my brain for a few minutes until I remembered from watching Rough Science that they used lemon juice to make the latex set faster. So maybe an alkaline solution will make it set slower. At first I couldn't think of any alkaline materials I had at my disposal, or at least any I could synthesize easily. But then I remembered that you can make a solution of potassium hydroxide, or potash, from fireplace ashes, and I have no shortage of ash from keeping the fires running all this time. I'll add some to the latex catching coconut shell and see if that helps, as the potash should diffuse into the water while the ashes sink to the bottom, away from the latex. 
In the meantime, I'm going to spend the day building another terrace next to the first one, since I have no idea exactly how much area my farm is going to need. Just that it'll have to be bigger than our old garden. In an effort to convince Dad of the futility of relying on the garden reliably to feed us all in the event of an apocalypse, I remember calculating at the time that it would take an area three times the size of our living room planted with only potatoes to sustain just one person for a year, so that's the approximate area I'm aiming for, with a 2x safety factor. I'll leave a little path between the terraces so they're easier to access. Done. My legs feel like rubber. I'm going to bed now. Week 3, Day 5 I managed to stumble my way through my morning chores, my legs still kind of weak, and gathered some extra firewood so I could stay on top of it. I finished firing all my clay pots the other day, and it seems a shame to waste the fire heat, so I'll take some time to prepare a whole bunch of small pots that I can use for cultivating the plant starts later. I'm particularly interested in growing the bottle gourd seeds I collected from that one specimen. It'll at least give me a little more time to rest before starting on another terrace. Unfortunately, it's been another boring, exhausting day of mostly digging, and I realized that I couldn't afford to start getting blisters, as they would prevent me from doing any other work and could become infected, which would again be the end of me. So before I began, I took a moment to crack a rock into a reasonable shape, and to fix it to the end of a stick with some bamboo cord so I could use it kind of like a hoe for digging up dirt from a more standing position, to at least save my back and change the wear patterns on my hands. This time I made my terrace in front of the first. To keep it stable, I had to reinforce the back wall a bit and make it slope. At this point I realized that, because the terraces were facing south, the retaining walls would cast a shadow that would limit how well plants could grow there. Since I'm near the equator, though, it won't be a very big shadow, so I just tried to aim the slope of this wall to be a bit lower than the sun in the sky. It also occurred to me while I was working on this that I could let the vines of the yams and sweet potatoes drape over these walls and take advantage of that surface. This may help me get out of building any more terraces than I absolutely have to. Week 3, Day 6 I got an extra load of firewood for the Sabbath after fishing this morning. I have to say I'm really looking forward to taking tomorrow off. My back and arms are absolutely killing me after four days of digging and hauling to make my terraces, and I've narrowly avoided getting blisters on my hands from using the digging stick and hoe by wrapping them in plant fibers to increase their coefficient of static friction. Just one more terrace though, and I think I should be set for the foreseeable future. Week 3, Day 7 I collapsed in a heap at the end of the day yesterday, so I'm looking forward to some light work today. After going fishing in the morning, I took a walk through the forest and dug up some breadfruit, fig, banana, and grapefruit saplings to plant. I checked on the birdhouses while I was out and about, and the chickens seemed to be enjoying them. I picked up a few eggs and breadfruit while I was there. When I got back, I used the set of small clay pots I made the other day to start growing the saplings I collected, as well as the bottle gourd seeds I found a few days ago. I don't have enough pots for all of them, so I'll use coconut shells for the smaller plants. This shouldn't take me very long. I also checked on the latex strip I laid out the other day. It has solidified, but it's not quite what I expected. It's sort of stretchy and elastic, but it also tears easily, and the heat makes it sticky. I remember that I'm supposed to add sulfur to it to make it stronger, like real rubber, but I don't know where to get any. In the meantime, though, it's kept the latex I collected overnight from setting, remaining a thin, white liquid in the coconut shell this morning, and I'd like to continue experimenting with potential uses of potash, so I'll sacrifice another one of my larger pots, fill it with thoroughly burnt ashes and water, and let it settle before decanting off the top, leaving the ashes behind. While I was working on the potash, 
I remembered that alkali mixed with oil could be used to make soap, so I heated some of the potash in a bowl with coconut oil until I got a mixture that frothed. I then added various fragrant plants from the island, like jasmine, frangipan, vanilla grass, and red pine cone. On the one hand, it feels kind of girly to get this excited about nice-smelling soaps, but on the other, I've been working out in the sun for three weeks without a shower or toilet paper, so I'm really looking forward to feeling and smelling clean again. However, there's also a good practical reason to mix fragrant plants in with the soap. In the tropics, plants have to deal with a lot of bacteria and fungi, so they create compounds that kill them so the plants don't get sick. By incorporating those compounds into my soap, I can also keep my body, clothes, and dishes largely free of pathogens, decreasing my risk of dying from infections, so this is actually very important. I'm starting to get on a roll here as far as useful lotions and potions are concerned, because while the soap was cooking, I remembered from rough science that lime oil contains compounds that absorb UV radiation. I'm not sure if the same compounds are present in my grapefruits, but I ground the rinds to a pulp with a stone and a clay pot anyway, using them like a mortar and pestle, and then added water until a little oil floated to the surface that I could decant off and mix with a little coconut oil to give myself something to spread on the back of my hand. I'll leave it in the sun for a while to see if it has any effect. Even if the grapefruit oil doesn't work, I can use clay powder or ash as a binder to hold it to my skin and physically block the sunlight. It's been about an hour of solar exposure, and the sunscreen seemed moderately effective, so I'll whip up a larger batch. This should help me protect my skin from sunburns and resulting dehydration and pain, which could again lead to my death if I'm not careful while working outside. Up till now, I've been wearing a heavy grass coat all the time to prevent any sort of sun exposure, which might have given me heat stroke if I hadn't been careful to monitor my internal temperature and been drinking distilled water like crazy the past couple of days when I was digging my terraces out in the sun. The soap mixture finished reducing over the fire, so I took a pot out to the rivulet and gave myself and my clothes a much-needed wash. Between the coconut oil soap, flowers, and grapefruit oil, I smell like a pina colada. I'll leave my clothes out to dry in the sun and have lunch, and then figure out what to do next. In keeping with today's running theme, I decided it would be a good idea to create more tools and materials for maintaining good hygiene which again serves my survival by reducing the risk of infection. After preparing and eating fish every day for three weeks, I can't stand the smell of my own breath, so I decided to make a toothbrush. I carefully shaved some bamboo fibers and bundled them together to make a small brush, which I tied to the end of a small stick and confirmed that it would fit in my mouth. The bristles are thick and rough, but I always like the hard, tear your gums out kind of toothbrush bristles anyway. Next, I'll need some kind of toothpaste to go on it. Toothpaste functions both as a gentle abrasive to polish teeth and an antibacterial to reduce the growth of microbes that cause tooth decay. Once again, wood ashes seem ideal for this function, as they are mostly a fine powder of calcium carbonate, also known as limestone, and the potassium hydroxide in the ashes will also kill bacteria and neutralize the acids they produce, which cause tooth decay. Calcium minerals in the wood ash may also be useful in remineralizing the tooth enamel, but I'm not sure about that one. I can use coconut oil as a binder once again, and I can add plant juices to give it flavor, since the potash gives the paste a bitter flavor. Fine clay could also be used as an abrasive for toothpaste, so ironically my sunscreen could also double as toothpaste. I made one toothpaste with vanilla leaf, and another with more grapefruit oil but I found the grapefruit oil made the toothpaste extra bitter, so I ended up siding with the vanilla ash toothpaste instead. It kind of reminds me of the sweet travel toothpaste we would use when going on vacations when I was a kid. I have soap, shampoo, toothbrush, and toothpaste. What now? Maybe I could make ammonia for a cleaning agent by distilling my urine. But I'm not partial to that idea because I don't want to boil my pee in the same machine that's producing most of my drinking water, even though it would be one way to recycle water that's otherwise lost to urination. I'll leave that idea on the back burner for now. I could make ethyl alcohol the same way by fermenting fruit or sugarcane, 
neither of which are in short supply around here. But again, I don't want to get ethanol in my drinking water, as I've never been a drinker. What I'd end up with would probably be more like vodka than anything else. That reminds me that I want to eventually start planting sugarcane and bamboo around my base, but I'd like to plan things out first. For that, I need paper, but my paper supplies are getting low, so I'll go for a walk to collect more bark for paper, and maybe some more firewood, though I know I'm really not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. This is kind of a unique situation anyway. Like Rabbi Brent used to say, life trumps law. I spent a couple of hours collecting wood and bark from the forest before mashing the bark for paper and leaving it out to dry. It's starting to get dark though, so I think I'll go to bed early. Celebrate mistakes, come on! It's long past... It's long past time someone should have come... La, 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 la. It looks like a few of them... It looks like a few of them had... It looks like a few of them had problem. That's a typo. I gathered some more... <laughs> I've already discovered several pieces of edible... Several species of growing out of the hole in the bo... Growing out of the hole in the bo... In, for now, though, I was just, for now, though, I was just, I, effectively, arrow part. I then spent about an hour of digging, I, I then spent an hour, I then spent about an hour out digging up more, out digging up more ba bamboo, 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 bamboo. I then spent, spant, I then spent. I land spent about an hour digging up more yams. Why is it easier in that accent? Still, just in case, I should put some kind of emergency drain somewhere on the dike that di that diverts back into the rivulet in the event of an emergency. That, sir, uh, is redundant. Plants glow, plants glow all year round from those uh, tropical rays, I suppose. If I can get, if I can. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They should make. <clears throat> excuse me. And while adding water did seem to help, I can see the rubber has precipitated out of the solution. Like I hope. There should be a negative in there somewhere. Uh, Father, I crave cheese. So I heated some of the potash in a bowl with coconut oil until I got a mixture that. Until I got a mixture that frothed. That frothed. Frosty, so mad, and added water until I got until. Hmm. Typo. <clears throat> and then added water until a little oil to give myself something to spread on my back. And give myself to give myself something to spread on my on my on the back of my hand. Typos, typos everywhere. Hey there, you made it all the way to the end. Thanks for listening. I'm planning on making a new video slash audio segment every week for the foreseeable future, concurrent with my stay on the island. Though I finally run out of plastic bottles to send my messages in, and have moved on to writing them on Easter eggs instead. So, if you like this and want to listen to the next one as soon as it's laid, you can press the bell button under the video, and someone in a terrifying furry costume will sneak into your house and hide it under your pillow. Now, YouTube is literally not my business. I'm not trying to make money off of it or anything, but it would still help me out if you could also press the subscribe button, because it tells the morally dubious ship YouTube algorithm to shift course a little closer to my island, and maybe even get close enough for me to sneak aboard. They'd probably just throw me straight back, though, so it would help me out even more if you could share this video with someone nicer who you think would enjoy it. And since you apparently enjoyed it enough to get this far, there's a like button under the video that's shaped like a thumbs up, because it makes my thumb greener every time someone presses it, which in turn helps my crops grow better. However, there's also a dislike button next to it that you can press if you didn't like the video, but one, if you didn't like it, why did you watch it this long? And two, it makes my taros wilt, which means I'm going to go hungry. Why would you do that? 
Also, if you'd like to chat about your own stories and perspectives on the episode, feel free to write it on the comments section of the pizza box below to have it delivered to me. Cheese, please! I'd love to hear about your gardening slash homesteading tips, tricks, and innovations, or if you have any ideas for what I should name the chickens. That said, thanks again for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.